Now, choosing the right vehicle and path for investment is perhaps one of the most important decisions you'll need to make as an investor. You need to know that which choices are you going to make for whichever stage of life that you're at. Do you have the right tools? Do you know the investment options that are available to you? Are you taking the right steps towards financial freedom? On our first episode of Money Mastery Season 4, we host Samuel Gishohi, the Head of Business Development at NCBA Investment Bank Brokerage. He will be answering these and more questions and he's also going to be sharing his thoughts on the money investment mindset. Welcome to the show, Samuel, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Always my pleasure. Thank you, Samuel. Now, we'll dive straight into it. We have a lot of conversations about investments. The, the topics are varied, but most of the time we don't talk about the, say, the, investor, uh, the investor. Let's demystify this phrase. What is the psychology of an investor? Right. Um, psychology of an investor is really about the, the, the fact that investment is, is, is an art. It's, it's not a science. Um, yes, true, there is in the background several issues or several you know, statistics that somebody might be looking at in order to make investment decisions. But at the bottom of the whole thing is a myriad of emotions um, that drive investment choices. Uh, this is because most, most investors, I mean, you, you're investing your hard-earned money. You're making life life decisions. So where you put your money um, would be very important to you in terms of how you feel about whatever um, choice you make in terms of investment. Key in this uh, consideration is fear and greed. Um, because first of all, greed drives a lot of, uh, we are a very gullible lot, especially as Kenyans. You've heard of all the different uh, you know, pyramid schemes and stuff that happen. And these are usually driven by greed uh, because somebody come and tell you, you know, give me your 1,000 shillings, I'll make it 2,000 in a month. And, you know, immediately you're like, wow, I can quickly b become very wealthy or very rich rather, not wealthy. And, and so that, that greed leads to us making the ones because then we are not making the decision based on a considered position but we're just basing it on the fact that we can double our money quickly. Um, fear comes more from, um, one, where do we get the money? It's hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. uh, two, there's a way we are programmed as we grow old in the way we discuss money in our, in our family setting especially. If you look back at uh, when most of us grew up, depending on where you did grow up, um, a lot of the time, if you wanted a toy or you wanted something, your parents would tell you, Hakuna pesa. Pesa, unajua pesa ni If you lost a shilling, it was a big war, isn't yeah. it? So we are emotionally handle money as a positive thing. We are emotionally programmed that money is this thing that is sometimes even evil, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is so hard to get that you have to protect. I mean, it's not wrong to protect money but does this program us a mindset of investment doesn't program us to be in a mindset of investment because then we we are more inclined to go where we feel safe rather than where we know is safe uh, we are more inclined to 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 follow the hard to do things that other people are doing because we feel that because somebody else succeeded in it then ours will succeed which means we start following you know the fear of missing out and following the hard rather than decisions on our investments because we are not in control of those emotions. Um, there's a lot of external factors that also come in um, because at the end of the day, where the economy, how do we feel about money at a certain time? Uh, what investor sentiment? Listen to a lot of the financial circles, you'll hear us talking about investor sentiment. Sometimes people are in the mood to invest, sometimes people are in the mood to you know, hide their money under their mattresses or save it. And so all those issues are the behavioral aspect of investment. And they actually mean a lot more than, you know, all the formulas and all the, you know, ratios that we might throw in there. 
to make a decision because then you might be looking at some investments that look very good and you're wondering why they're making losses. And this is just usually a function of the different investment cycles and emotions that investors are using to make the decisions. Right, right. So without a quote-unquote following the crowd, how would we know which investment is good for us? You know, we're told to start investing from a young age, but surely the choices and the needs of a 25-year-old are quite different from somebody who is, say, 55 years old. Yeah? Walk us through that. Well, the first thing uh, that we need to understand before we even make a decision on what exactly we're investing in is what we call a risk profile. How, how, how are we averse to risk? How do, we, how do we handle losses? How do investments, how much do we understand what we are investing in? And so when you're looking at the different age groups, you're going to see that um, younger people, let's say, let's put it between 18 and say almost 30, which is that age where you say um, you are, um, you're, you're, you're starting off, you just got a job, uh, you're probably now starting to earn money. And so at that point, the chances are you have a lot of, um, you don't have a lot of responsibilities. You need now, to, you, 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 you can, you're learning, which means you will make mistakes. Um, so it means that at that level, you're much more, um, you're much more, you have a higher propensity for risk because you have time. Remember time horizon, the time value of money is a key factor in investment. So because you have time, it means you t t do investments that are more risky. Um, because you have less money, you're more interested in what can give you a higher return. We call it the risk return trade-off. So chances are you'll be looking to take advantage of those shorter term cycles rather than somebody with more responsibilities, say between 30 and 45, uh, who is now looking at family, he is planning for the, over time, he is starting to plan for retirement. Now when you're younger, you're more interested in those shorter term utility positions, you're more in, you're, you're, you have more time to... You, you, you have less knowledge, but again, um, and it ties into the first question where we were looking at the psychology, it means that how you behave with risk will also have a lot to do with your future in investment. Because when you say you, you, you invest in something and you lose money, do you go back and learn more about it so that you invest better next, or do you decide I'm never going to invest again? Those are the key things that you'd be looking at when you're trying to figure out your investment journey. So at this level, what I would really advise the younger generation is look for somebody who is um, in our, in our in industry financial advisor. And a lot of people don't know you can walk into my office and we have a sit down and have a discussion on investment and we'll do a risk profile and sort of figure out. And this is not a a one-off because of changes. As you grow older, your propensity for risk, your aversion to risk change. So at, at, at this time, we just want to figure out um, what is right for you so that we can be able to guide you into the right direction in terms of your investment decisions. So it's time now to start looking for that advisor who can help you to make such, to understand yourself as an investor. Mm, right, right. So from what you've just illustrated, uh, it would look like like it's all gloom and do for the young investor who wants to venture into the world of investments. Let's look at a 20 year old who's new into the job market and they're interested in investing early. What are the options that are available to them? Well, I think um, the issue of options should come after you understand what, understand what you're investing in and what your intentions are as an investor. Um, and, and, and I think it's Warren Buffett who said, never invest in something you don't understand. So point, you need to be first gathering the sort of information and knowledge that will help, help you to make a decision and understanding you are also what we were just talking about in terms of where are you at in your investment journey. And that inform um, what, what investments work for you. Are they shorter term investments? Are they longer term investments? Are they riskier investments? Are they, but if you just jump in investment vehicles, and there are several of them. There are very many out there. And um, a lot of the time, especially with us, uh, with the financial, you know, uh, the financial industry, is somebody will be selling you a particular 
particular investment, so they will look from the point of view of that particular investment. But at this point, because you, with time, you will start looking at things like diversifying from a particular investment because your needs, your time horizon, and your knowledge is changing. So the idea at this level or at this point in time where you're looking at I'm starting to invest I need to know what to invest in um, the idea between those two questions is first to understand yourself to understand how much you have in terms of disposable income and what what areas you, you need to be to be understanding better in order to make. and that's where the investment advisors come in oh, okay. Let's keep the, keep ch uh, the, the picture of the young Warren Buffett starting to invest and we bring it closer home to Kenya. We have a young Kenyan who wants to be a Warren Buffett at one point. What should their investment objective be at this point? Objectives are created in the mid short, medium to long term. And uh, if you look at most of the, of, of, the, of the way you set objectives, which are also linked to, of course, your risk profile and your access to finances and your knowledge of whatever product you're investing in. Uh, these objectives, uh, one of the key things that you need to look at is, for example, liquidity. Why? Because I've seen a lot of people come and they want to invest and they've just you know, started earning some money or maybe they just made a deal because then money comes in different forms. And uh, so somebody comes and they put money in a long-term investment without realizing that in the shorter term, there is that issue of they might need some money, an emergency can happen. So they end up selling the long-term investment, which was a good, a good decision in the first place because they need liquidity in the shorter term. Um, again, in the shorter term, there's a lot of fluctuation in terms of the value of different investments. And because of that fluctuation, it means that um, sometimes to create liquidity, you need to be in these shorter term, more volatile in investments where you're buying low and selling high. Where you're looking for those investments that you can quickly make a cycle, maybe in a two, three, four month, you know, short term period and make small returns and then start channeling those into longer term those profits into longer term and uh, medium term and long term investments. But notice even within that space, um, because this is now has a lot to do with liquidity, it means that you may be gaining sometimes and losing sometimes. So again, um, at this point, you're, you're in as much as you're forming your objectives, you also l need to learn how to handle those cycles so that they work for you. Um, so objectives need to be structured. What, is, what am I looking for in the short term? Is it just enough you know, for my small, small uh, you know, side issues uh, that I need to finance? In the medium term, am I looking at, say, school fees for the children, a nest egg for the family, etc.? So you're putting your money in safer uh, investments that will give you some sort of uh, consistent income. And then in the longer term, but notice, the longer the investments, because they tend to have lower risk, they'll give you a lower return. So again, they're not very appealing for the young generation. Because again, the younger people want something that they make a lot of money with quickly. But then that also sets them up uh, for, the, for the person who's bringing, you know, bringing into their space um, some pyramid scheme, because then that guy is going to be telling them, I'm giving you 50% in a month. So they will tend to shy away from what is longer term. Now, I remember we used to be told money does not grow on trees. trees yeah. That is very true because money grows like a tree. It takes time and it takes, you know, you have to keep watering it. You have to keep nurturing it so that it grows to that level. Mm -hmm. See, and as you go along, some branches will fall off. Losses will happen. Um, market cycles will happen. But all those are part of the of the of the of the journey and so they must be part of how you set your objectives you've mentioned the concept of risk and for a lot of investors it's something that they really look for ways of avoiding but when we look at it on the flip side what would risk mean for us can we use it for our good when we're investing well with risk is a good thing i mean without risk then investment would not make sense um, because what, what, what you get paid as a profit, we also call it a risk premium. The more risk you take, 
the more returns you can make. Yeah. So uh, sometimes I always say, if 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 you went and, uh, and 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 took money from someone, you know, against their will, that's a huge risk. You can get shot. Yeah. So the return, if you get away with it, it's a lot of money because you did nothing for it. Okay, it risk someone's life. But at the end of the day. You see, there's a huge risk to that. Mm -hmm. So the more risk you take, so if you go and start a business, for example, and you go and start, say, a kiosk, and all your money is in that kiosk, uh, if to, to, tomorrow something goes, you know, all the money lost is yours, and you can actually lose all of it. Yeah. So, and whatever returns you get from that, you'll find even the, the sort of, from that business where you put all your money and all your energy in, then the returns tend to be much higher. Um, then you go in, into other th things that maybe is managing and you give them your money so that they can manage. If they are managing the risk, you know, there is probably less risk because they are from an, they are investing from an informed position. But then again, your money is safer, but it will earn you a little less. So as I said earlier, the longer term, the less the risk and the more the less the return so the tendency is even at a young age as we were saying you want to be doing those things that you're actively involved in but what you want to do over time bring that money into less spaces um, so that your money starts to work for you um, passive income if you can build a strong passive replacing your active income, which you're earning from waking up every morning to go and work, and putting it in a space where your money is earning passively, so you don't need to go and do anything for your phone to give you that, you know, pesa in India, you know, or something has gone into your bank account. Mm -hmm. So that is how risk works. You need to be moving from the higher risk over time and moving it into the lower risk, but also in the process of moving it into the lower risk, reinvesting whatever you're earning from that, so that it creates what we call the snowball effect. So it means that, Warren Buffett called it the ninth wonder of the world. It means that your money starts earning more and more and more over time, so that by the time you reach a point of, say, retirement, mm -hmm. you have replaced your income. You know, you, you retire, but you continue living like, you did before because then you're getting money but you don't have to wake up and work for it. Okay, good. I'd like to bring in some statistics. The Kenyan market has been quite uh, keen on investing. We've seen a lot of growth in the recent years. But what remains unique is that 63% of the investors in the Kenyan market are women and only 37% are men. Quite a gap. Why do you think this is the case? Well, we can go back to cultural issues. We come from what was hunter-gatherer situation and secondly in a paternal society. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a tendency for women to be the gatherer. Mm -hmm. uh, most of these responsibilities like school fees, household stuff, will tend to sit with the men. The men yeah. um, and, and so there is a more tendency for men out there doing the more risky, you know, um, day-to-day -day business deals rather than investing it. Why? Again, men will tend to want to be in control. Yeah. They want to make the decisions. They want to be the one that, uh, you know, he's in control of his money. Mm -hmm. So they don't feel comfortable a lot of the time when somebody else is the one investing their money uh, in something that they have no direct control of. Uh, women will tend to be more risk-averse mm -hmm. So they will tend to look for those vehicles where they can put their money and it just, you know, works for them without really running for those quick, quick, you know. So again, you will also, men are very good at generating those high returns because they take a lot of the risk. Uh, women are good at generating those low long-term nest egg type of investments, which safety and safety net. Um, so this is just a function of um, now starting to, to program or educate men that they, as they build on those, you know, quick, high risk, you know, uh, good businesses they're doing, lifting that into longer term, um, more uh, stable and, you know, 
um, investments that give them a, a, a sta sta stability. Because then what happens now is in older age, and you'll notice men die, <laughs> men tend to die younger. Yeah? Why? Because um, once they stop doing this active you know, stuff, they then run out of money very quickly because they did not invest it. So now they start having to rely on what? Family? Yeah, mama has money now, eh? and even the children give mom the money. Um, so the tendency is for them now to go into a stress situation, they can't handle you know, retirement. So then it's a very important thing to start educating or getting men into that space of investing. Yes, now on that very realistic illustration of uh, the disparity in the investment, uh, the, the investment uh, nature in Kenya, we will go for a break. And when we come back, we'll be looking at retirement planning. We'll be looking at the options that are available to you as you get closer to retirement. But before we come back, keep your questions coming in. Samuel and I will be looking at them after the break. Don't go too far. Candice, what's that? I brought you a small bonus. Bonus for what? Daddy said you helped us get a house, a car, and mommy's business. But I only helped them get the loans. Mm, you did more than that. You got us 299 family dinners, 64 kisses on the cheek, 12 road trips to see grandma, 42 jokes from daddy, 49 laughs from mommy. In over 60 years of dealing with numbers, we've learned that the numbers that matter the most to you are the ones that matter the most to us. NCBA Bank. Go for it. Welcome back to Money Mastery Season 4. We've been talking to Samuel Gishohi, the Head of Business Development at the NCBA Investment Bank Brokerage. And Samuel, right before we went for uh, the break, we looked at a very scary statistic that 70% of Kenyans don't have an income on retirement. How did we get here? Investment is not part of not just our curriculum, mm -hmm. even our upbringing. And uh, money for us, even within the family. Something that you, is not even easy to find. And so our, we are already programmed to treat money not as an, a tool. You see, we, we, instead of treating it as a tool, we treat it as something that we are scared of and, you know, is very hard to understand. Um, then we, we, we are not, our education system will teach us to budget, will teach us accounting, will teach us the, some financial concepts about valuations and stuff, but will not teach us about investment. Um, some parents, I'm, I'm quite happy about um, my, my, my dad, because what he'd do is, if I did something out of what I'm supposed to do, like wash the car, or you know, do something that he felt was outside of, you know, like washing dishes is something I was supposed to do, um, he'd give me something for it, oh. see? And then if I wanted to buy something, he'd remind me that I had some money, he paid me, but he'd also make sure I'm the one who went to the shop to buy. So I started to link working for money and what to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, it all went in the shop, I would also feel bad. So I started, you start to start linking money and now later on, of course, that's how I ended up in this field. You know, he would tell me about things I could invest in. Now, those are things that most of us don't get introduced to um, as we, we're growing older. Um, um, then we get jobs. Uh, we are starting to learn about that's, that's, that's where we are. We start the passive things that we need to learn about. Then we don't actively go and try to learn about them. So I've, I've, I've noticed over my time in the investment industry that even those people who will pay that 2,000 shillings to go and listen to an investment talk will tend to increase their, their capacity to survive at the end of their employment period or at the end of their 
active, active, you know, income earning period because they took time to learn. Such a huge, I mean, we spent a lot of time on social media looking at funny videos and I don't know, they call them memes or something. But we don't spend time looking at, at you know, things to do with investment and how to savings into places where our money works for us. So what happens is by the time we get to retirement, we haven't thought about the longer term, medium term and short term goals we were discussing earlier. Understanding that this it's an, it's an inevitable thing to happen, that we shall get older, we shall retire. So our younger generation, they get a job, we're living in a consumer society, what are they fed on social media and on TV? It's a, con a lot of consumerism. So the first thing they do when they get a job is what? Buy an iPhone, you know, get some sort of uh, is it DSTV so that they watch football. And some of these things are eating into money that they would be using to be able to uh, create investments. Um, those behaviors also allow us to start looking for how do we create money for investment. So somebody will be saving, but they're saving to buy a consumer good rather than saving to invest so that they can replace their income over time. So it goes back to our culture, what we are taught and our bringing. Yes. It's something that we need to change. We need to change it, yes. Now when you look at where we are coming from and the consequences, which are the investment decisions that we make, where do we go wrong? What are the mistakes that we make as we invest in Kenya? Well, one, one, we fail to have um, a, a clear plan, mm -hmm. you know, have a plan of, on, on what, what is our strategy, what, what is the plan, you know. I mean, don't even have a budget. A lot of us don't even know if we are in negative, positive territory. A lot of us uh, borrow to feed a lifestyle rather than borrow to invest so that our money is working for us. Because if I'm borrowing, then how am I going to pay? See, and that's because we are coming from an, a mindset of, you know, being employed vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, understanding vis-a-vis -vis investing or doing some sort of business. Remember, our education system is a bit skewed to that. So one is, of course, have have a plan. Have a plan. Uh, what what are my objectives? You talked about them earlier. A B should lead, you, you know, to C. Um, the other issue is that we don't, um, as I said earlier, money, money, value is king, but, but uh, information is the key. We don't go out and seek, you know, and seek information and knowledge about investments and the different options uh, that are out there. And uh, because of this, then we, 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 we end up just, you know, being in the wrong, um, the wrong, mindset we end up being in the wrong space in terms of planning our future in terms of investments mm -hmm. um those those would be my key areas which i feel if we changed those then we would be able to start charting an investment culture mm -hmm. um and changing even our mindset regarding you know how we treat we treat money in our lives yeah interesting so for us to change the narrative we have to get the right information and importantly, where we talked about it earlier is do your due diligence. Absolutely, and, yeah. and that, that's very, very important because what happens is when somebody tells me I'm going to give you 50% mm -hmm. for your 1,000 shillings, we don't go and check, you know, um, what are they going to do with their money. I, I always uh, used to tell investors in town, remember there were times we used to have a, uh, you know, issues with hawkers running around and everything. If you okay. see a group of people running on the street, what do you do? Do you just start running after them? Yes. Or do you run just long enough? I usually say run just long enough to ask the guy running with you. Why are you running? Yeah. Because the moment they tell you why they're running, maybe it's raining, <laughs> you know, and they're running because their hair will get wet. Nairobians fear rain. And then what, what do you do? Is get into the nearest shop, buy, an umbrella, buy some umbrellas, and uh, start selling them to these guys who are running. So sometimes we lose um, opportunities um, to invest because then we enter into a, 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 
a situation of fearing. And because we are cared of that improbability, we end up just running with it, you see? And because fear of fear of uh, missing out, we are doing things because of the emotions we discussed earlier, rather than tying in those emotions and using that fear and risk to our advantage. Oh, interesting, interesting. I'd like to pull in the audience on at this point and take on a few comments and questions. We have Wanjohi. Wanjohi, thank you for joining us. And his question is that his expenses are more than his income. He's often left with nothing to invest. What advice would you have for Wanjohi? Behavioral change. Mm -hmm. It's not how much you have. It's what you do with the little you have. And as I said earlier, we are programmed a certain lifestyle. And we take loans to, to, and it's very easy to get these uh, loans eh, on, our, on our, there's even mobile apps. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the moment um, these guys see you're earning some money, they're very quick to give you a loan and then you start paying interest, especially on those shorter term loans, and you end up in debt cycle. Now, to get out of that debt cycle fast, if you're spending more than you earn, it means then you're already in a debt cycle. Uh, you need to go and look at what, what is eating into you. Because the moment you're in debt, you're paying interest. So every something you're paying. So the first thing you need to do is pay down that. What most people ask is how? How do I pay to look at, at those consumers? Those things you don't in your life. Um, I remember we used to be told to avoid, especially when you're young, eh? yeah. stop buying things from the middle shelf in a supermarket. Why? Because they are brand to be there and it's more expensive than a lot of other products that are the same area, but because this is a brand and you're buying, buying the brand. Some brands even have, you know, their own dedicated fridge. You see one with all the other yogurts, but one with a particular brand. Look at the price. They tend to be a bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. That's a penny saved. I mean, walk into a supermarket, don't feel ashamed. Eh? The, the, we have a, this thing about uh, people living like the, the Joneses. So, you know, and I'm with my child, and they pick something I hadn't budgeted for. I put it back, you know. Let him cry, let him scream. That's not my, my, we need to learn that this is what we came for, and this is what is budgeted. So we stop doing this um, spontaneous buying. But also take a calculator with you to the supermarket. You'll find that um, the, 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 the amount you're paying for something is, is higher when you buy buy a certain package than it is, you know, if you buy Cadbury, for example, the chocolate, mm -hmm. that chocolate, it's not Cadbury, it's chocolate, drinking chocolate, right? Mm -hmm. um, they sell you with a tin, and then you go home and you finish it, you throw away the tin, mm -hmm. then you go and buy another tin, without realizing you're buying the tin, you're buying that container. Mm -hmm. They have other small paper Such ones, it. which you should mm -hmm. be buying too, and you save like 50 bob. So start looking at those things, it's not about a lot of money, it's about those small, small things. Start walking to work if you can rather than taking that motorcycle. Start carrying food, cook your whatever is left over at dinner, put it in a container rather than coming to and spending 200 and that evening you go and throw away what you left yesterday because it's already spoiling. So it's just behavioral changes that you need to start looking at where are these little holes, what am I paying interest, what are the short term debts I can get rid of so that I reduce the interest rates because they tend to be higher interest paying and then sort of restructure it so that you're paying less and eventually get rid of debt and start creating now a certain amount. Then pay, pay yourself. Pay yourself. If I walked to work at the end of the week, I would have spent 500 shillings which I did spend. Go and invest it. So you see do an all-round inventory not only on your money but on your habits absolutely okay. some of us want a budget to be in our head it can't work it can't work thank you for that uh we have damaris thank you damaris for joining us damaris is asking where can i get knowledge or information on the right kind of investment to undertake well that's what we do and that's why we are here um not necessarily just on uh, on money mastery we are, we are there as an investment bank, 
you can come to my office and we have a chat. You can call me and sure will give my contacts and you can call me and we can have a discussion so that now we are able to do um, the profiling, we are able to look at how your, you know, your earnings are and then we can advise you on where or what is best or suits your investment style depending on your profile. Thank you. Kefa says, great conversation for, for joining us. He's asking something very interesting. What is the difference between greed and a high-risk appetite? Um, a high-risk appetite, greed is when you do it without thinking, where you stop, you throw um, fundamentals, you throw the, the, the structure, because and somebody has, and, yeah. and this is what most of those uh, dubious investments always promise you, <laughs> okay? Um, I mean, look at, uh, I've been watching recently about some people who've made it a business mm -hmm. to, to call people and tell them you've won the lottery, you know? And so someone calls you out of the blue and says, oh, you've won the lottery and you need to send them some money for processing these lottery winnings you have. I mean. I, um, I remember who used to pray to win the lottery, and uh, it was a joke a preacher once said, God one day told him, why don't you buy a lottery ticket first? So how did you win the lottery if you didn't buy the ticket? That's greed. Because you are, you are accepting that you've won, but you never bought a lottery ticket. Mm -hmm. um, high investment appetite is a different. And in fact, if you look at a lot of uh, investors that we deal with, most employed types mm -hmm. will tend to have very, to be very risk averse because they're used to a structured income mm -hmm. process where every month some money comes in and then they plan it, mm -hmm. okay? Um, if you look at business people, because they're used to investment cycles, they're used to, you know, there's money today, there's no money tomorrow, they bought something to come and sell, and by the time they got it to the market, the market had changed, so they have to figure out what to do. They have used to that high-end, high-octane situation, so they're also very good at dealing with uh, high, higher risk investments. So high risk invest investment, you know, appetite is one, a function of which, notice the reason business people are very good at that is because they're also very good at reading situations. See, a business person can be taking something to Nairobi city market. He gets a phone call and immediately decides, no, he's going to Kajado. Yeah. They're very quick to make such decisions. So even in situation, they are able to look at an investment, see, I'm only getting in this tomorrow morning, it's not, I would rather take a loss and move on yeah. because they're used to de dealing with such situations. So uh, see what is the what is the business person basing his decision? He's basing his decisions on information. Remember? Information is key. They take the information, digest it, and make decisions. But this guy who is greedy is not is not using any information. He's only going to a business because so and so he went into the business and now they're driving a car. So they assume if they went into that same business, they will be driving a car. But they don't look at what happens in between. So you have to put in the work. Absolutely. Yes. yes. So we have Francis. Thank you, Francis, for joining us. He says he's due for retirement in three years. He feels he's not prepared. Is it too late? Well, in money matters, it's never too late. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you're still alive. Yeah. Um, of course, at your age, you can't take too much risk, so you need to put you have. Uh, I think the best would be to look at where you are, mm -hmm. what you have. I'm sure if you're employed, uh, you probably have you know, some sort of money that will come to you maybe when you retire. Mm -hmm. So it would be a good idea to come and speak to us as investment advisors, and then we look at the sort of your uh, short-term financial liquidity needs once you retire, because then you, will, you won't have a salary. You probably have a pension that is not as much as your salary, so you also need to bridge that gap. But you also don't want to risk you know, that sort of lump sum you might be getting um, in something too risky, because if you lose it all, then 
that's a recipe for disaster. So there's always a plan that we can come up with that is going to suit your needs. So I think um, at that level, reach out to us and we can be able to assist. So what you're saying is that NCBA, you have the option of having a customized. That is what investment bankers do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have Mutua who's saying, hi, Evelyn and Samuel. Hi, Mutua. He says he's been saving regularly, but how can he diver uh, diversify his investments? Yeah. Um, well, savings come in several different you know, ways. Mm -hmm. Right, and so um, when you say saving, are you putting it in an interest? Are you saving through just a bank account, or are you saving through an interest-bearing instrument? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if you've been saving for a while, it just means uh, to me, it just means I'm already profiling him. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just means you're not very young. You've been, you know, you've been, you've been doing it for a while, oh, wow. which means you've already created a certain pool of savings. So the issue to start looking at the different options. Again, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. So again, where are these savings? I think this is now time for him to come. We look at what he has. We always go back to the profile mm -hmm. because then he wants to diversify. Mm -hmm. Telling him a certain thing to diversify into and it does not suit his risk, uh, propensity for risk or his risk, his risk aversion will not help. So I think this is when you come to now us as investment advisors so that we to have a discussion around how do you then structure these, these funds. Because then I remember I said earlier, you don't want to take these savings and put them in a long term place where there is no liquidity and then tomorrow you need liquidity. So we need to have sort of structure, some objectives and sort of, you know, a diversification process that is going to suit the individual. Everybody's financial needs are unique. Mm -hmm. We can pull them in different age groups. But remember, uh, we've just seen somebody become king at 70 something. Yeah. So maybe he has suddenly gotten a huge increase in what he earns. Mm -hmm. Right? Then he might be able to take more risk. Yeah. Because then at, at, at he's getting a job at 75, that's probably where our 24-year-olds, okay, I'm sure <laughs> this is somebody who's much knowledgeable about money. But mm -hmm. you can see where I'm coming from. Sometimes you didn't have the money, but at a certain age, you know, you are 55 or 60, and something mm -hmm. happens and you get a lump sum, yeah. and you feel like it's enough to take some risk. So people are different. Money comes at, in different forms and shapes. Mm -hmm. So let's discuss it at your level. Uh, great, great. Uh, we have Dennis who has a question for us. Thank you for joining us. Dennis, Dennis is asking, is there a bad time to start investing? No. Good question. Uh, no. <laughs> That's a straight off no. No. Investing can start at any point. There's an investment. Um, there's, a, there's several types of investments that put whatever different level you are at. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people, hakuna pesa kidogo. And, and that's the, most, the one I hear the most. Mm -hmm. um, that because I have less money, my investment is not important. Mm -hmm. But it's not important just to you. It's important to everybody. Um, because as I said earlier, it's not how much you have. It's what you do with the little that you, you have. have. Mm -hmm. Warren Buffett started with what? I think it was $14. Mm -hmm. okay? I don't think he was earning a million. But it's that which grows because over time. Now, let me give you an example. We have seen people in very, very good um, employment jobs. But then they get into the lifestyle trap. And all this, so you have a lifestyle. And you say, you know, pesayako ni sayako, you know? Yeah. But people want to look like someone else, so that, you know, they, 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 their lifestyle, when they get a pay rise, their lifestyle changes. Okay? So we have all these guys who, this year they will be on TV singing Solidarity Forever. <laughs> and then one year later, they are back on the TV. You know, we are told they were given the raise, but one year later they're back on the TV singing Solidarity Forever. Why? Because the moment they got a, a, a pay rise, their lifestyle changed. Yeah. Their children went to a better school, they bought a bigger car. So they're not creating, you see. And that's why sometimes we even see people being profiled by where they come from. Mm 
because they have a lot of money but they still buy drive an old 504 <laughs> you know and everyone is like this guy is a miser and then there's somebody else who the moment they have a little money it's a much bigger much more eloquent but you see what is happening you're not putting anything away for the future yeah. right so that those are, those are the kind of things we need to be very careful about when you get a pay rise the more you put away as an investment mm -hmm. the more you will have to live the lifestyle you want which we call financial freedom when you do stop working for money mm -hmm. the more you spend now it's called intertemporal choice yeah. the more you choose that now i get some money it's a very expensive phone nini, nini. i'm putting this in a lifestyle but when the money is needed most i would have Thank you, Samuel, for the nuggets of wisdom. It's been a pleasure to host you on the show. My pleasure. Too. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all that, that we have for you on this episode of NCBA Money Mastery, where we teach you how to make your money work for you. Join us for part two of this conversation next week on Thursday at 11, where we'll be looking at the particular investment products that can work for you depending on which stage of life you're in. For more information on our products, log in to ke.ncabagroup.com. Reach out to us on the numbers on your screen right now. You also follow, like, and share our social media handles. And until next time where we'll have a different set of numbers that matter, I've been your host, Evelyn Musyoka. Have a good day and take care.